Good evening, everyone. Uh, this is Varun, and uh, I'm. I really welcome you on this uh, rainy uh, evening in Goa that I'm sitting right now. A uh, rainy, lazy Saturday evening. So I hope uh, you'll be, uh, you know, listening to me. And uh, I know at times that you don't like to respond, especially on video calls and uh, meetings like this. So that's all right. Um, but during the session, if you have any questions, uh, you can definitely ask them in the chat. If you don't want to show your face and you know uh, ask it out loud, or you can unmute your mic. Uh, you can raise your hand, and I'm sure Mr. Murugaraj would uh, allow you to be a part of this session and uh, discuss the questions along. And uh, let let's have a good one because uh, this is Saturday evening, and uh, it's the time where your weekend normally starts. I mean, most of the people are back from their work. relaxing so i won't I, i promise i won't keep it uh, very intense i'll keep it uh, the tone would be fun uh, you know bordering on uh, enjoyment and things like that it will not be a intense session for sure all right so welcome you all i'll share my screen uh, along with you and then go on with the topic so uh, mr murugan if i may ask you is my screen visible to you Ah uh, yes, sir. Please go ahead. And my audio and my voice is uh, clear. Oh, uh, crystal audio clear. And my videos. Crystal yeah. clear. Crystal clear. Thank you. Okay, great. So the topic for today is storytelling in tourism: the way of the future. Uh, when I was discussing with Vivek about what to share uh, with everyone, because I've done a few sessions earlier, and a lot of th things sometimes get repetitive. So I wanted to try out something new. and some share something from my experiences so as the topic says uh, there will be definitely a lot of storytelling in this session uh, there'll be a lot of uh, stories about me i'm sorry but uh, i have to share a few of my experiences because that is what has been requested a few stories from the tourism industry in general uh, a few more from goa and uh, i'm glad that uh, mr murugaraj likes goa uh, but i am really hoping for him to come, uh, kind of answer uh, a few Uh, you know queries that we shared here along and then we will dive uh, the last part will be about how storytelling can define the tourism for future okay so i hope everyone is okay with that format uh if you are you can just show me a thumbs up or a click uh, or a hands up uh, uh, you know on the panel yes a thumbs up great so if you could just click thumbs up i would i would really be happy yeah great wonderful so our story starts today with a quote uh, one of the most interesting quotes that i've come across and one of the most interesting writers that i've come across and the quote is very simple it is a common knowledge that humans think in stories rather than in facts numbers equations uh, so all the things that you uh, were taught in your school uh, the equation the integrations uh, the trigonometry uh, the hypo, uh, hypotenuse and and all the riders that we saw during the school with so much memory it would have been better if it was stories and this is for a fact and the simpler the story the better it is so rather than having numbers equations figure facts in mind it's the best way to you know actually understand a story and that one of the reasons for that is we are trained for stories right from where we are born i mean i'm pretty sure you remember that one bad time story which have been told to you again and again rather than you know how uh, or what would be the square root of a particular number so i think it is very and the whole thing is the human mind is trained for stories from a, a young age and also the type of stories also matter so if you are uh bombarded with really complicated stories uh for example some people are made to by heart uh you know this long uh um, shakespearean stories in their college and their school sometimes it gets tricky and the same goes same case goes with everything else in life including tourism let me let me uh put out a fact which i believe in uh and i am a part of soul traveling which is dealing with experiences and cultural trails so me saying that might come across as a little controversial but history can get boring at a point of time if it is bombarded with a lot of facts lot of uh, information it can get boring so as we go further i will start with my personal story with some anecdotes and then we will dive deep into what soul traveling is doing in goa okay 
So let's let's start with our first story. This is about a, a young boy who's just uh, you know through school, listening to stories, loves history, uh, maths not so much because of the fact that you know stories are uh, definitely better. Loves reading books. Uh, then he does uh, something unthinkable. All right. So after uh, his twelfth, uh, he does engineering. okay that's not uh, very surprising because i think almost a lot of us does do that first and then decide what to do in life and then again the same thing of working in it in um, in india uh, in uh, you know uh, and then in frankfurt so okay i'm some of you might have guessed now that young boy is me i was sitting here right in front of you and what happened is when i was personally uh, i graduated as, as an engineer from goa and i was working in it in in uh, bangalore and then in frankfurt and the whole uh, thing up happened that i mean happens to almost 80% of us after the first 5 6 years of your work first 4 5 years of your working life you always think what is this what i'm meant to do is this something that i really enjoy doing for me the question was yes i loved what i did in it but i wanted to explore what more is there uh, you know across and what i can be a part of and what better to do it than to explore with stories right so that was the simple goal that i had when i was working in europe so i started visiting different countries and luckily i had the perk of doing it because uh, you know of the work that i was doing and uh, i managed to visit uh, a few countries which came across to me as some uh, very interesting and the stories that they uh, put across were something that caught my mind so i'm going to run through a few of them uh to uh, who people who have already attended a few of my sessions they might be repetitive but trust me uh, i also try to include a lot more than just one uh, one or two stories which might be repetitive and I- i'm i'm hoping that you will bear with me for those couple uh, stories as well so first uh, country that i visited first or second country that i visited um i was just walking along i had my backpack on and i was just walking in in uh, one of the places there which was very highly recommended uh, uh, on lonely planet on trip advisor and i come across this sign so can anyone guess where this was uh, i'm pretty sure few of you might know this uh, or can anyone tell me what the sign is um, in chat section if you guys are okay i can even have a look at the chat section or okay can anyone tell me uh, where uh, i found the sign right so this i came across when i was just walking into the carlsberg mu- museum now i'm pretty sure most of you know what carlsberg is and the carlsberg museum is actually located in copenhagen uh, and this swastik was in fact the sign the logo of carlsberg till you know in the mid 40s in mid 1940s when the whole meaning was distorted and uh, the whole uh, story around it completely changed so i i i never knew that you know this connection was also there uh, between india and probably uh, a beer that you usually drink uh, on a lazy sunday saturday afternoon i'm not sure how many of you are drinking that right now so this is something that i came across and i was surprised i was like okay this is something very interesting and this is something that really caught my attention and also uh, opened up a world of storytelling to me which was not previously discovered or i had not actually previously seen in that particular uh, you know sense uh, moving along i visited a few other countries in europe met a lot of new people uh, one of my favorite places was of course budapest uh, which was beautifully designed beautifully uh, kind of uh, had different stories to tell from different parts of the uh, st- uh, city uh Uh, but what caught my uh, attention the most was the prominence given to the local stories there and trying to develop a culture around something that already existed uh, and trying to promote that uh, so something like the local baths that you have in budapest the ruin pubs that you had so that was something that really captivated me when i was there um okay now uh, i have not just put a photo of myself here but uh, i want to actually tell you what is right behind me so this uh, behind me uh, is a place in paris called catacombs 
So catacombs is, uh, I mean, you might be aware that catacombs is a place which normally has uh, yeah, the human skeletons or the bodies. But the whole thing here was you actually had to wait in a line for a good one hour. You had to spend your money, uh, spend a good 30 euros for this. And when, once you went in, you just had this huge pile of skeletons out there. Now, it was interesting uh, because the experience was something that you will never have anywhere else uh, uh, in the places. But what I also realized is you could actually market skeletons. You can actually have a tourist attraction around skeletons or graves. And I was like, okay, if that is the kind of potential that is there with catacombs, with, uh, you know, graves and uh, with uh, skulls, there is, there is quite a few things in Goa or in India, which we have not explored yet. And which we could actually have, you know, uh, if you just put in your, put your mind to it, if you tell the story, right, there was so much uh, happening around it. So uh, this place actually has 6 million skeletons, uh, which were brought from different parts of Paris and then uh, put in, uh, in that underground tunnel and location. Uh, it has an eerie feel to it. Some people believe that is uh, people who have got lost here. Uh, uh, and uh, they, uh, not all parts of this is open to public, obviously. So this is something that I saw and I realized that, okay, if there is tourism, it can be done in a very different way than we are doing it currently. It need not be the same old sightseeing where uh, you book 10 different places, you book your hotels, you actually visit all the place one, uh, you know, then just go around by yourself looking at the things. There needs to be more to it. That needs to be a story around it. And that has to be true with all parts of it. And that, that can be true with all parts of it. It need not be only the places. It can be the same with the whole country. It can be uh, the story can be around the transportation that is there. The story can be around the restaurants that are there. So I'll get to uh, a back. Uh, I'll get back to that in a lit uh, little longer. I'll just want to drive back into the catacombs of Paris. So from Paris, I visited um, the next place that I visited was the most favorite place that I've been to, and the most exciting place that I've kind of been to ever. Uh, it's the land of ice and fire. Uh, can anyone put in the, their chat, chat windows uh, where I'm, I might be talking about, what I might be talking about? Anyone can guess this from maybe the uh, picture itself or, uh, you know, the title. Okay, I have three seconds and then go. Okay, I got a, oh, so I have the answer right there. Uh, it is in fact Iceland, right? So Iceland is the place which I believe I've not seen a place like that anywhere else in the world. Uh, I've visited that uh, Iceland in somewhere in uh, um, 2016, in the mid 2016s. And what I came across was, you know, beautiful stories from different parts of the villages. So they have this uh, huge Viking uh, story background to it. Uh, they have a lot of trekking that happens in different parts of the uh, country. Though it is a country which is not easily favorable for long-term uh, inhab inhibition, like uh, um, you have um, Reykjavik, which is the capital of I Iceland. Uh, the entire city will be made up of around three and a half lakh people. And that is 75% of Iceland population in itself. So imagine a place which has only such a uh, limited uh, kind of resources and the way it has developed through its tourism. I mean, I'm pretty sure all of us have that dream of going to this particular place. They have uh, curated their stories around the, uh, the hot water baths that are there, uh, the hot water springs that are there, the geysers that are there, which kind of pump water out every certain interval of time. Um, the kind of treks that, uh, which you see, I mean, if you have one uh, particular location, uh, it's called Landmanagur. If you go there, you'll actually see different kinds of, you know, shades of green in the same picture. So it's like, you know, you look up around and you'll see different shades of green in one particular picture. So that is the kind of storytelling that is there. And what is very interesting is how they have put it out there. So Iceland will come across as one of the safe, safest places to go one of the most um, hospitable pl uh, places in the sense, the hospitality of the people itself is projected very well and something that is a wonder of nature. So that is what, I mean, people always think when we, they think, think of this particular place.
Uh, moving on. I would say I'm not sure uh, some of you might have heard of it uh, and more of you recently because of uh, this thing called Game of Thrones that everyone was crazy about. A lot of Game of Thrones was shot in Dubrovnik. Uh, it's in Croatia. And uh, so the first thing that comes up to your mind is when you're going to Dubrovnik, I want to visit all the places which Game of Thrones uh, has been shot. And Game of Thrones is one of the most popular TV series that is uh, around in the world. Now, the first day that I checked in into uh, a homestay, I met uh, our host and uh, we were just talking. I, we didn't even speak about Game of Thrones. And the first question that he asked me was, uh, I hope uh, you've not come here only for Game of Thrones. And I was like, I have not. Uh, it was not the only thing on my agenda, but that was also you know, a focus uh, area for me. So what he said next was very interesting because this is a thing that, uh, you know, uh, if you, once you meet the locals, only then you can understand. So he mentioned about how Game of Thrones has kind of uh, taken over the entire scene where a lot of other stories, which were earlier depicted very well in um, uh, Dubrovnik are getting hidden. He told me about uh, the wars that they suffered in 94 uh, with the bombings coming in. The capture, uh, the, there was this uh, war around Yugoslavia that was there. And the entire thing around that whole story. And he actually was uh, a kid when that happened. And, you know, how his experiences uh, kind of, uh, you know, what were there around that time. So that kind of opened up a alternate uh, window to us other than just uh, what was, you know, shown, which is the common uh, shown thing that was shown. So these are all the stories I wanted to tell you today because... What I learned from the, those one and a half years in Europe was if you build something around stories, it will last on for longer and then it has more power of multiplying rather than just fixing that this is what you want to do, like one particular location. And Europe has done it pretty well. If you look at, uh, if you ask, uh, you know, kids today or youngsters today, what do they want to do? Uh, where do they want to go in India or anywhere? The answer will be, you know, Eiffel Tower in Paris, uh, uh, you know, going to London or going to uh, maybe uh, Portugal or, uh, you know, places like uh, more recently you'll have Spain because of a certain movie that's come out. So this is how they have managed to tell their story very well. Having said that, how do we look at India in that context then? Because if Europe can do it with such limited resources in such a good way, why not India? I mean, we definitely have more geographical area, definitely have more cultural uh, importance, uh, more manpower, more um, monuments that are there. So why is that story is not being told effectively uh, enough? I mean, uh, I understand that people love India because of whatever is existing, but have we worked well with the storytelling of it? I, I believe not. Maybe at the end of the session, you can tell me if you really feel uh, differently. Or, be, uh, or that, you know, we need to do more work towards that. So I was just, uh, that is when, so this is my in Europe. I came back uh, to Goa. I quit my job um, and then soul traveling happened. So soul traveling was something that I wanted to do in Goa, India, where we change how people travel. We should travel more for experiences rather than just uh, sightseeing or just looking at things. And that is what this whole concept was based on. Uh, and I'll tell more about it towards the end of the session. Uh, but then uh, during this period of, you know, uh, starting something and uh, researching on it, I came across a few campaigns which really justified how storytelling should be done. Um, I'm not sure how many of you have checked it out, but there's a campaign called 100% Pure New Zealand. It was launched a while back. It took a lot of years to sustain. But if you look at the way the storytelling is done in uh, by tourism in New Zealand, people always keep it very close to their heart and they always want to kind of explore the spaces. So New Zealand uh, kind of, uh, you know, got in this experiential tourism space pretty early. And uh, if you see a lot of local hosts trying to invite you there, uh, a lot of people saying that you should feel at home. We want to share culture with you. Uh, obviously, things have changed with the COVID pandemic, um, which is coming. 
but if you look at the overall branding around it uh, new zealand was something that was uh, a benchmark uh, especially this campaign of 100% pure new zealand was a benchmark and they had this uh, stories around how you say good morning in different places uh, of new zealand so if you um, get time get some time just look up for this campaign uh, around uh, new zealand uh, about how they say uh, you know uh, good morning in different places and all the videos from from this campaign are presented to uh what i also love is some storytelling that has happened through movies in tourism so i'm pretty sure you recognize the first movie i mean it is one of the most uh, you know popular movies that have come out in the last decade and after this movie you have everyone running to this particular location this particular festival uh you have the tomatina festival that is happening in bunol you have skydiving happening and everyone wants to go and do this trip to spain ah uh, so much so that after this movie the tourism the indian tourism to spain actually shot up by 60 65% and this movie got recorded in you know the syllabus uh, in spain where they actually teach about how this impacted the tourism in spain so what i want to convey here is storytelling has the power not only through you know someone coming in and showing it but through movies through campaigns through uh, different kind of uh, platforms Uh, storytelling can actually impact the tourism of a place the same thing happened with dil chahta hai in uh, goa as well i mean there were quotes in 20 2009 2010 where uh, there were prominent people from the goan tourism industry uh, who said that they had invested in the movie and promoted it so that the tourism in goa kind of resume now all of i mean if you ask most of the goan they hate this particular fort being called dil chahta hai fort uh, this is a thing that we have suffered in the uh, same thing but this fort of shapura this iconic picture is something that you would obviously see you know across uh, and you would always want to recreate this kind of uh, memories a recent campaign that was very impressive was uh, this campaign around uh, by madhya pradesh tourism so th- how the storytelling has taken off with certain uh, states of india uh, or you know certain interesting states like madhya pradesh rajasthan kerala they have tried to take uh, a different uh, way of storytelling and telling their state so this was a very interesting video that came out with uh, zakir khan who is a famous uh, stand up comedian discussing with vidya balan about a recent film that have that was shot in madhya pradesh you had you had this film called sherni being shot and they actually speak slowly about the locations and slowly get into the story get it get it more interesting and they diverge towards you know how beautiful these locations are and how people should actually visit madhya pradesh as a state to kind of you know experience it themselves so this is very strong uh, campaign of how a movie is connected to uh, a location but with stories you can actually make it more popular and work on the marketing part of it as well all right so this is what uh, you know i wanted to tell about storytelling in different formats so you have the movies you have the locations uh, you have uh, you know the people you have uh, different brands around it you have restaurants you have food you have wine so these are all uh, the things can tell a story of a particular uh, location that's what i very strongly believe uh, now this question is a little controversial how does the world look at india i would want to restrict this to only a tourism point of view okay uh, people might have different answers politically ethnically a lot of lot of different answers but let us restrict only to tourism do you think the world looks at india as the most favorable for a place for tourism right now or is there much more that can be done with respect to tourism in india um i believe we are in a state where a lot of story of india has already been told in a certain way but there is a potential for huge lot more to do especially in terms of making sure that the story is told right and um, you know around it you have other campaigns built right from you know keeping it safe to making sure it is accessible the different places are accessible to making sure the monuments are uh, selected nicely to you know having the right people telling the stories i think that is where the potential that is you know we need to explore more strongly and here i really want to uh, say that experience based travel is the way to uh, go forward uh this is because uh, we have seen sightseeing model in the past i mean till now and uh, even till today we have a lot of people who work with the sightseeing model where they just see one two things they have a plan thing and 
they travel only after they are done with their regular work so travel happens only you know once you save enough or once you have enough time uh, with experience based travel you need to make travel a part of your life it is something that helps you grow helps you understand people better and grow as a person in life it is not something that you do only after you have your time and only for leisure so that is the perception we have to change or not just that you know from sightseeing to experiential based travel but making travel a part of your life will actually help you understand things more clearly uh, so this is what we have been trying also for the past 3 uh, years since we have started soul traveling and uh, i i would like to say we have been pretty successful with people actually trying to you know experience more places uh, and this is a model which even when i was uh, i came back to india in 2017 there were a lot of people um, who were slowly moving to the towards this model so it was not very uh, um, strong in that sense but today if you see there's a huge increase in people who want to experience things than just uh, visit a place storytelling in tourism can happen through different uh, people different uh, in different ways we saw an example of how new zealand as a country has Uh, told their story in a very nice way of it being a place of uh, wanting to exchange culture uh, of being a pure uh, kind of natural habitat uh, you know a lot of uh, tribes are being showcased there here the government of new zealand has done a commendable job in putting it up putting their story out similarly in a few states in uh, india are story promoting that like especially rajasthan uh, the padaro maro desh campaign which worked around a story of rajasthan Kerala God's own country was a brilliant storytelling campaign that happened so government has a strong onus on telling the story of tourism to the rest of the world we also need great storytellers and hosts so people who are from those areas it is always uh, better to work with people who are native to that place and who are interested in telling the story so this is an industry that is um, i would like to call it the experience based travel industry or off bit travel industry um where you have a uh, constant interaction with uh, local communities and that is how the story of the place is conveyed so you need to have a strong base of the storytellers uh, in any place uh, goa in fact is developing that quite well now we have a lot of people lot of colleges in fact who are uh, teaching travel and tourism as a subject uh, you know for 3 years uh, and there is a whole lot, lot of companies coming in trying to work out the story of goa to the world um you need marketing agencies of course i mean you cannot uh, do without marketing agencies because of certain ways that they actually think of uh, you know in in that particular fashion so they play a very strong part in telling the story of the tourism of that place uh the media of course so you have uh, i would say social media print media uh, all kinds of digital media also movies uh, the, uh, you know series that are shot there they tell a very interesting story the monuments experiences uh, in that place and the culinary and logistics stakeholders now this form a very important part of the storytelling circuit and frankly around 20% of a, of the amount that people come i mean especially in respect to goa they always spend on culinary and uh, 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 only culinary that's food and drinks okay so that's quite a lot of amount that you actually end up spending on culinary um, you know uh, side of your travel so it is very important that the culinary section tells the story of that particular place in a very nice way i'm not saying that you only have to focus on the local uh, things at all times but you need to make sure that the story is told right you cannot just you know uh, have uh, uh, you know random things uh, without giving it a nice story or otherwise on the long run you lose out i'll give you examples of this in future in my next slides but uh, this is something that i strongly believe that the culinary stakeholders can actually influence uh, the tourism sector in a very nice way to improve the storytelling okay uh, so i would want uh, a couple of you to answer this question uh, maybe mr murugraj can also join me here i just want you to know uh, i just want to you to tell me how well you know goa as a place what what do you feel do you know goa well you can say yes no anyone I I wouldn't have told you that I I visited Goa four years ago. <laughs> okay, but now okay, from what you've heard about Goa or heard Goa story, 
how well do you feel no or how do you feel no how well do you know goa are you going to i'll go ask some questions maybe a quiz <laughs> can with four options kon banega <laughs> karodpati <laughs> okay i'm not going to do that but what i've always come across is goa is known for its parties its beaches its parties again its bikinis maybe that's what i've always heard of people talking about goa so now i'm going to tell you a story of goa which you probably did not hear much about uh, and uh, you know a little bit more of detail in that as well uh, this uh, was during our experiences when we explored goa for the past 3 4 years i mean i've born and brought up in goa but i actually explored goa for the last 4 or 3 to 4 years and these are the stories that we uncovered and these are a very small part of those stories okay uh and trust me when people come and hear the stories they are really surprised because you don't associate you know goa with that normally but this is a case with all the states in india whenever unless you you know actually experience the local cultures and you know unless uh, people who are visiting actually go out on the street and actually interact with the locals they will not have a different mindset and this is this owners rest on the storytellers of that particular place so the storytellers can be the people who host uh, others or who kind of take you around the monuments uh, the media and all the other things the the transportation stock stakeholders the food stakeholders that is how the story will get spread and i'm really happy to see this change in goa happening and people are slowly you know changing their mindset so how many of i don't know if you know about this there is a village in goa which is submerged uh, throughout the year and only once in a year it kind of emerges out uh, for two months maybe two two and a half months uh, it's it's a village called kudi uh, and once uh, it kind of Uh, the water goes down you can actually see um, the temple the remains of the temples there is a feast that happens there is a temple uh, jatra that happens uh, uh, you know and then there are uh, homes of prominent people and this is a beautiful scene i mean beautiful village it was covered by netgeo a couple of years back as well so this is uh, a story which was very interesting um, uh, the village was submerged actually while building a dam and only when the summers hit the water goes down in the entire village gets exposed uh, so this is something that is very interesting which happens in goa uh, so we spoke about zindagi na milegi dobara uh, like you know going to spain playing the tomatina festival if you come to goa in june uh, you have a, a very own tomatina festival it's called chikal kalo so chikal is literally mud so this uh, festival is celebrated by actually playing in the mud uh, in in the grounds of goa and it is like complete i mean uh, it is completely filled with people the devotees and stuff and because of covid we did not have it for the last two years but when things resume and things get better obviously i would invite all of you to come and see this festival it's it's very unique and very beautiful uh, which actually happens in a place called marcel in goa okay uh it was also celebrated at uh, the devki krishna temple uh, which is one of the unique ones because you normally have temples dedicated to radha krishna uh, you know but with this biological mother these are this is one of the very few temples that exist so uh, there's a tradition in a village called zarme uh, so uh, in, we have a time of the year called shigmo uh, which is a traditional uh, celebrations that happen it's a period of you know a few days uh, and during that time in a village uh, there is a festival called chorotsav which is celebrated now as the name suggests chorotsav means uh, festivals for the thieves uh, so they actually enact this whole scenario where men are buried in 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 the mud uh, if you see uh, where uh, you know the villagers my mistake actually beheaded a few travelers and as a penance they actually perform this festival so this is uh, a story that is there in the villages uh, in the northern villages of goa the north uh, western uh, the northern ghats uh, or the western ghats sorry where we have this uh, you know uh, the festival celebrated and very unique one as well i mean you wouldn't expect an associate associate this with goa i would say uh navratri is a very popular uh, celebration that happens throughout uh, mostly western india and northern india during navratri uh, we have something called makhars in temples of goa which is very unique 
so you have the deities actually uh, you know um, being decorated with flowers and you have swings so they actually swung uh, to the tunes on those nine days of navratri uh, and uh, they and some temples they put off the lights and do this uh, in some temples the deities decorated like from the kid to the, the on the last day of navratri you have a old men as the deity i mean they have decorated in that sense so these are some very unique stories that you will get only in the temples uh, mostly in the temples of ponda area of goa uh we speak of legends i mean if you come to goa if you go to uh, the capital of goa called panjim uh, you'll see this gentleman uh, you know facing you and trying to do something to this lady who's lying down and even the goans wonder what is he doing there but uh, if you look a little deeper there is a very interesting story about it this gentleman's name is actually abey faria uh, jose costello faria is his real name he is one of the pioneers in the world for the for psychiatry so if you think of modern psychiatry today you would not have uh, i mean you would not want to write something without actually talking about abey faria who spoke about hypnotism who actually pioneered hypnotism and he disproved the work of this gentleman called mesmer so if you have heard of the term mesmerizing it comes from uh, mesmer and uh, he actually is hardly mentioned in any textbooks even the goans don't know much about it so this is a beautiful story of uh, you know him uh, being associated with french revolution uh, the revolution in goa he is also mentioned in this book uh, called uh, hunchback of notre dame by alexander dumas uh i mean uh, so that is the kind of level of stories that are there we just need to explore and put them out there and i'm pretty sure people will actually love to come for visiting places like this i mean if you go to uh, you england you would always want to see the places which jk rowling probably visited uh, and she based her stories on uh, i'm pretty sure there are these graves that you visit in edinburgh or this cafe in edinburgh where she wrote it but there are stories that can be created around prominent personalities in india which we have not done yet and we need to do and get more people coming into the uh, you know places for that those stories uh recently uh, i mean if you read the news recent uh, regularly um uh, this uh, gentleman uh, our external affairs minister mr subramanian jay shankar he visited georgia uh have you heard of the story uh, of our defense of, of our external affairs minister visiting georgia he went there for a particular reason okay so he went there to return the bones of a queen which were found in goa so he actually returned the bones of queen ketevan to the country of georgia which they were really happy and pleased about so there's this whole i mean if you visited goa and if you visited old goa you might have seen these ruins of a long tower which are it's called the agustinian tower but what is the whole story behind it why do people uh, actually you know what what are the stories around it why were the towers in ruins so this uh, and what were this bones all about why is it so important so this bones were actually of queen ketevan who was martyred uh, uh, and uh, who was who's really revered uh, the patroness uh, in georgia as a country they were so glad to have got this uh, bones back so this is uh, you know a connection between goa which is a remote place on western coast of india and a country in georgia which is a former ussr and you know you have this co- uh, connection that happens through this agustinian priest who come who uh, through georgia to old goa keep the bones there and years later you actually have this uh, recovered and passed back after a dna test they are passed back onto the country of its origin so this is something that you know really blows your mind off uh, in the stories and in the city of old goa i mean people don't know uh, goa for much of that it's only the beaches that we think about but in the past goa had uh, the old goa city had a population more than london or even lisbon at, at its peak it happened to be one of the most interesting ports which uh, you know uh, the portuguese would trade through uh, and portuguese actually occupied goa for 450 long years especially this part of old goa and that is why you had this window kind of a thing between asia and europe so everything that happened through uh, india or for asia the first would come to europe from europe to old goa and then to the rest of asia all right so th- this is just like a 
I mean, I did not have much fun, so I just pulled out whatever I could, uh, the few interesting stories. But there is much, much more, and this is there at all the places which are which we stay. I mean, you'll have stories in your neighborhood or you know in the places around you. We just have to look around and go finding them. It starts simple. Okay, so I spoke a lot about uh, involving stories in uh, tourism. Uh, you know, trying to make sure so, uh, the next part of tourism is based on experiences. And there's also another reason that I want to do this for. A lot of traditional crafts in around the world are slowly disappearing because they are not directly sustainable. An example of it was, uh, uh, there was this making traditional, uh, I think, bangle making craft, which was happening in North India, which uh, slowly took a backseat because it is not directly viable. And the process behind it is quite long. Uh, there are other crafts uh, as well. Because of the process, that it, the time that it takes and the final outcome financially, it is not viable to you know do it as just a craft in itself. What can save it is the tourism industry. Okay. So I like to give an example of this thing called PAV and we have an experience called life of PAV. Uh, so PAV is something that all Goans uh, love and I'm pretty sure none of us can do without. It's the traditional bread, but we can eat it for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And if you are talking about Vara Pao, that is also, I would like to believe Goa's gift to the world because the Pao went to Mumbai from Goa, right? But, and we had this old uh, traditional wood fired ovens, uh, which would make this Pao, uh, the, 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 this people, uh, the bakers who would make this Pao, and they would initially use toddy for, to ferment the Pao, the bread. But what happens is over a point of time, it is not sustainable because of the cost of the toddy increases or it is not really viable to commercially make power in that sense because the cost of a power is hardly four to five rupees. So what do you do in such case? In this case, tourism comes to your rescue. So you have a story around power and you have the tourists coming in and actually seeing how the process is done. So you use a local com commodity to actually you know, tell the story of a place at the same time, making sure the craft survives and uh, prospers. And this is true with a lot of other things in the uh, industry as well. There are some things which traditionally, if you go with the methods and, you know, kind of try to sustain, it is very difficult to sustain with only one single means of, uh, uh, you know, uh, financial model. So you try to add something new to it. It has actually happened with this called, uh, this uh, magical spirit, called Fini. So I am, I'm pretty sure a lot of you have heard about it. Some might not have the best memories with it, but the way Fini has been revived in the last two years has been magical and two to three years. And I'm really, really grateful to a lot of people who have actually done this. So, you know, people like Hansel Vaz, people like uh, uh, Cedric Vaz, um, uh, people who are actually trying to revive how Fini was done. Now, Fini was a, um, uh, so Fini is normally made from cashews, which is a traditional fruit got to Goa from, from Brazil by the Portuguese. Uh, very interestingly, people in Goa only make it, make Fini in the way they do. And that is why Fini has a GI tag in Goa. So it's a geographical indication tag, but it is made in a certain region in a certain way. Uh, you don't have it in Brazil as well. So, uh, and this was traditionally made and Traditionally, a lot of people used to look down upon Feni saying, Are, this is something like a country liquor and something which tastes bad. But the way it was revived, the way people started projecting it in the last couple of years where different brands of Feni have come in commercially, people have started visiting the Feni distilleries, people have started tasting how Feni is uh, done. It has actually taken a complete new, um, uh, new meaning altogether in this. It is not how it was, uh, you know, traditionally projected. And this can happen with a lot of other country liquors. As, I mean, so-called country liquors as well, or so-called uh, something that you really discard out. You can actually make a view a nice story around it and actually take it to the world in a very different way. Uh, so this was mainly about tourism. I would uh, like to briefly tell you about what we do at Soul Traveling. 
Uh, Soul Traveling was started uh, three and a half years ago. Uh, uh, so I'm one of the founders and Kedar is another founder of the company. And we try to, uh, you know, change how people perceive Goa and also how tourism is done uh, generally across Goa. So uh, apart from being featured in different uh, magazines, we have already uh, 30 plus locations where we do our trails experiences and we have 100 plus hosts whom we work with to kind of project it out to the world. Uh, uh, it was really nice when one of our walks was rated as one of the most unconventional ones in India by Livement, uh, which was actually around um, the traditional art of Kavi, which uh, was discovered in a few churches of old Goa when they were doing the restoration work. And there's a beautiful trail, beautiful story around how it came there. So that was a walk that we had done. Uh, we have this island exploration in a place called Divar, which is one of the only islands in Goa which is not connected by road. So you have to actually take a ferry to go across. You can take your car. There are people staying in the island and there are beautiful stories around the island. Uh, we actually visit the fields. We actually meet the locals out there. Uh, now, a lot of people think that Goan houses are Portuguese houses. Uh, I definitely oppose this because you will not find such houses in Portugal as well. So I feel this is one of the terms which is uh, created by uh, mostly the people who sell houses, uh, people, uh, I mean, the agents, because you have a whole look of Portuguese houses, uh, I mean, the feel of it. But these are very Goan houses and we actually have an experience which kind of helps you explore the houses in Goa, you know, and actually meet the people out there. Uh, there's something in, uh, called Shora, which is around nature, where you visit, uh, we do a boat ride through mangroves, meet the locals out there. The Shisharani in Kankona. So there is a place in Goa where you have, uh, when you cook rice along with three people uh, on their heads. So that is, that is one of the craziest experiences that I've seen and the interesting story that I've seen. Uh, we work with a lot of hosts, a lot of people from the villages, uh, the local communities, uh, different professions. Uh, so we have writers, we have architects, we have historians, we have teachers, and they all come together and try to tell the story of Goa. Uh, and uh, we have uh, had almost 100 of them, 100 plus of our hosts uh, whom we have got on the same platform together. And all these experiences are different uh, from each other. Uh, on how they are curated and the concepts and you know uh, so that is how we go about it the whole idea behind this of you know the tourism of uh, storytelling uh, including storytelling in tourism is very simple you should feel a part of the place that you visit you cannot just uh, you know now it is the time is up where you know you, you the places would just attract people on their own uh, where people would go to Taj Mahal just take a picture uh, come back probably People need a little more. People need to understand it, understand things a little deeply. People need to kind of, you know, feel a part of that place, take something back with them, uh, interact with the locals. And this is, uh, this form of storytelling is here to stay. So it might be through the host uh, who actually host you. It might be through the government. Uh, it might be through uh, marketing agencies, uh, culinary experiences, or food places, or transportation agencies. I mean, we have beautiful campaigns being devised by uh, airlines who are actually getting people to a particular location. Uh, through all this, the story of a destination needs to be told in the best possible way. And uh, we have started it with Goa. We hope to do it in the rest of uh, India and rest of the world as well. And hoping, forward, hoping that you'll be joining us on this particular journey. Uh, so that's my time. Thank you so much. Uh, it's a pleasure being a part of this uh, and I'll be happy to have um, an answer any questions that you might have. Um, Mr. Murugaraj, over to you. Thank you, Varun. I was not, I mean, I, I was, I was, uh, you know, so hoping that you did not ask me any quiz questions on Goa. <laughs> uh, thank you, thank uh, you for having me. I mean, I, uh, jokes about this was, uh, this certainly is one of the, you know, best presentations that we have uh, uh, posted uh, in a Saturday webinar. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, I think there's a question coming in for me. Of course, that's, that's Kani's our, uh, you know, our regular member and then she, 
I mean, you, you cannot have a session without Kani having a question. Absolutely, it's nice to meet you, Kani. Okay, um, uh, uh, Varun, uh, uh, it was a very very nice afternoon, and I must admit that I have not been attending the sessions on Saturday afternoons for quite some time. And when I saw this name and I saw the description, I actually have something else to do, but I am doing this and I'm not trying to make you feel that I did you a favor. I must tell you, you did me a favor. Okay. Now I have to tell you the thing I tell every time. And that is my father was a part of setting up the Department of Tourism, Government of India in 1953. Okay. After which I was born. I have also worked in tourism. I worked in Mercury Travels for four years. I worked in Cox and Kings briefly, and I was um, uh, was I I was the DGM <laughs> of uh, the tourism of the MP Tourism Corporation um, from tours and marketing. Okay, so I have tourism is my that has how I started my corporate career many many years ago. Like I'm two hundred years old. And in three days, I'll be 201 years old. So <laughs> I was very happy because I have a lot of people in Goa. In fact, one of our members is also in Goa, Gora Bhatia. And um, one of our chief secretary from Madhya Pradesh has moved to Goa and he's a writer. And today he has posted that he's been accepted for his children's stories. And uh, he's a very exciting person. His name is Anthony Dissa. and he writes under the name of Tino Desa and so that's and goa is a, a, a place where my classmate feni manikshaw visits often and tells us about it so mm-hmm. i thought of goa as the place of bikinis and uh, wine because i'm not a bikini and wine person and feni has always shown me a lot of greenery so uh, i'm very interested in that i've also worked for world wildlife fund so i have that kind of um attitude or aptitude or whatever it is um tourism is definitely the answer to um world problems in so far as the um biases and prejudices that we have and i think uh, there is a quotation by some famous author which i don't remember um i mean due to my age of course then that says that uh, the best uh, uh the best i think travel is the best um answer to bias or prejudice there is some phrase like that so i am very happy about that but i what i want to know is uh this is very because you are doing this commercially and i can may i ask a commercial question what will it cost to come and visit goa for one of your programs i think okay us uh, would like to travel i know that um uh, indian copy editors a uh, forum has a lot of people who are into travel and should be and it is great and storytelling is also very much part of travel and uh, i think i would i would like people to know how much it will cost uh, and what will be the because this sounds doable this doesn't sound like five star and you know four dog bada and up because i'm not interested in that i'm interested in home stay i'm interested in um you know staying in a school with my um sleeping bag and making a group like that i've done that with the world wildlife fund many years ago we i took a group to um, bharatpur and we stayed okay. so i mean please yes enough now <laughs> yeah no thank you so much for your question and uh, thank you so much kaniz i'm i must say i'm honored to actually you know be interacting with you with such a a uh, glorious background in tourism so i would even after the session i would definitely like to connect with you and take some advice uh, coming to uh, i mean the the commercial part of it uh, so our experiences start from uh, as much as uh, 499 rupees per person and then they go up to a little more uh, when i'm talk about talking about experiences i'm talking about the trails that we do so we do of yeah, uh, yeah. a 3 hour or 4 hour trail then we do a 8 hour trail or you know the whole day trail 
and then you uh, as we have 30 of them uh, at different locations what people usually do is they club different kind of experiences based on their uh, liking so we have something around food where you have a secret food trail uh, which takes you to the different uh, you know traditional eating uh, places of a place uh, we have a tribal food trail which take you into the tribes of goa so to give a ballpark uh, figure uh, one day's experience would cost you somewhere between 1000 to 1500 for experiences from the stay point of view and the transport point of view uh, so stays uh, normally we recommend uh, you know something which is home stays with people with uh, you know people around uh, different locations uh, so and these are not very expensive i mean uh, a max of 1000 uh, uh, per 1000 per person is something that i would say is good when you're talking day. about any number you're talking about a per day cost Yes, I'm talking about a per day or per 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 day per person cost. Yes. Where, uh, yes. Uh, and and does this include meals? Uh, no, usually the meals no. are separate. So this but is all our tours, basically. Yes. So yes. Uh, all. Oh, uh, sorry, sorry to uh, interrupt. So all our no, trails no. will have a snack, and a meal can be arranged additionally with the trail. So I would say a lot. It will come to around two thousand five hundred per day. now the only worry in goa particularly is the transport uh, because you know we have uh, a lot there of there isn't uh, any local transport yeah no. the public transport is not good and we don't have uber and ola in goa because of uh, yes. you know certain issues uh, we have something called goa miles but uh, this is a government run service but they also face issues because of the cab drivers and things like that so it is not very easy so for transportation i would always recommend having a vehicle of your own which is uh, you know you either hire it for the entire day or you have a self driven vehicle or getting your own vehicle especially in covid times it is very convenient uh, now if you look at a vehicle itself it will cost you uh, i mean uh, per person it should cost you somewhere between 500 uh, if you hire a, sm- a smaller one 500 to 1000 per person and then a bigger one would be somewhere around that so 500 per day so if you consider all of this per day you can you know do very well in you know 3 4000 rupees or 5000 max and this you can do the experiences you can do the stays you can do so do the travel as well uh, but particularly soul traveling we are mainly expert into the experiences and the curations around it for the stays and the transport we normally have our own tie ups with different people who are the experts in that field so that is how we usually work but i think we can have a doable uh, model and uh, i mean if it is the entire thing that they are looking at then we can definitely plan it out uh, with details for the uh, icf as well we would we would love wow. to you know host people in goa I, i mean that's what we love doing and especially just you know listening to their stories as well and trying to get that part of our culture uh to people who visit here is something that we really love doing and currently uh, we have a team of around uh, 12 people who are all from uh go- most of them are from goa and they are also experts in different fields so you have architects you have content writers coming in everyone gets their own kind of backgrounds to it and then we curate this experiences in different villages and goa you know if you look at it even though it's a small place every part of it is different in a in its own way so you won't have something which i have here in i am i'm in margaon by the way so margaon and panjim is something very different then you go to wagatur and people normally look at baga kalangut as goa uh, which is not the case so uh, like delhi is not india <laughs> absolutely so that is how we are trying to put out the story and uh, i mean even if you right from tasting of feni to checking out a pav in a local bakery and trying to make it yourself and then you know having it with a curry which is a shakuti which is like a local goan uh, curry this is something that we would plan out usually on a day and with the other stories and experiences coming in something around fishing probably if people are interested something around uh, the nature or uh, the culture of it and things like that so this is how we go uh, about it um varun i would uh, i would like to add a point uh, usually in the month of june every year there is uh, publishing next conference Uh, mm-hmm. that happens in goa um i mean of course in the last couple of years covid has uh, you know ensured that nothing is happening uh, so i that's that's a time where uh, you know most of us publishers publishers editors i mean everyone everyone in this field uh, you know we come together and it's it's a grand gala usually uh, okay. probably um, 
if everything goes well by 2022 when we have a conference there we should have some plan uh, absolutely we would love we would love to host you and uh, just to add to kanisha's point also uh, what also depends here is which time of the year you come to goa so june i think is a very good time because it's beautiful i i especially love the monsoons not too many people like it but monsoons are the best time to visit in goa especially because of the greenery around and the cost of everything is cheaper as compared to when you come in december and january when things shoot up especially the uh, restaurants and the hotels and the food prices uh so if anyone wants i would recommend coming in that june july august september kind of a period uh so that you know they can actually experience uh, what the locals do and how we kind of live around here and things like that so uh i would say if you do it in june it will be much cheaper than if you do it uh, later on in the year so june will also be a month of uh, mud festival that you mentioned right yes the chikal kala which is in marcel that is a special one uh if i have some videos i'll send them across to you and you can probably share it with the group uh, if you would be interested but uh, and, and you talked about the uh, yes sorry i'm sorry uh, you talked about a village that surfaces only during the summer so will will june be a good month to uh, witness that event so that will uh, probably uh, submerge again by beginning of june so you have it open in april and may Uh-huh. and by beginning of june once the rain start the village starts submerging again mm-hmm. so for that you will have to come probably in may or april uh, one of this uh, months uh, so um, but what happens is every month there are one or two very interesting festivals that happened in goa so it's it's that good i mean if you look at it uh, like in in january you have this three kings festival that happens in kansavalam it's a beautiful event uh, you know where three boys are decorated as kings which go on top there are some other festivals which happen some event where something submerges the something which is can related to carnival happens in one month so every month you'll have those two or three events which are definitely there there's a jag there's a thing called jagor that happens in in a place called sigolam which is celebrated bo- by both the hindu and the uh, christian community together mm-hmm. they both sing their own uh, verses for the same festival and it happens throughout the night it actually happens uh, like you know the the thing goes on Uh, the entire night so it's you know something like that so you'll have uh, this happening uh, at least two or three of this happening every month so 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 may i take it that uh, the month of june or uh, july would be a month where we can uh, experience most of these things and of course uh, you know with many things happen in a year it may not be possible to cover all things in one in one visit so um will 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 june or july be a month where we can enjoy Uh, the maximum or uh, experience the maximum absolutely so uh, i would also like to add on to what mr prashant morya uh, mentioned on chat and prashant is a very very interesting person he loves uh, i really love what he do he's into uh, you know trekking and also a lot around uh, nature he's into composting as well so a lot of uh, very knowledge knowledgeable things and also uh, someone from tourism background so he mentioned that june is also the month of sancha festival which happens on 24 june where, where can, can you guess what happens at the end of like you know what so basically people jump can you guess where they jump uh you you on mute into the river no into the wells so people actually yeah. go into the wells and jump so this is a, a festival go jump in a well <laughs> but it, they do it in the literal sense uh, it is actually dedicated <laughs> to saint john the baptist uh, and you can see people actually going into uh, uh, neighboring wells jumping celebrating so this is a beautiful scene across goa and uh, i mean you must experience this it happens in june in, in on 24th of june so this is this is something that which is a lot of fun as well so you'll have you know all these festivals during the rains coming in and you know so i i would advise to come during june for sure i was happy to hear you mention something about new zealand because my yeah. child and she lives in new zealand and mm-hmm. uh, it's her wedding anniversary she had a civil marriage there last year because of covid they couldn't come back are here so i what i spent time there in uh, march 19 unfortunately i was right in the middle of two uh, masjids that had a incident but i was not affected at all and i don't want to talk about how well the new zealand government managed that because it is very well known and it's on every uh, site that you can have about news 
What impressed me about New Zealand is that I thought sitting in the libraries, and that's where I went and spent the day every day, and they have amazing libraries in Christchurch. Um, I thought about the stories that they have and how much respect they have for the Maoris. And the fun was that I thought I would dig up stories from India, from a particular region of tribals in India, and they would have similar stories. For example, there was one story in uh, New Zealand that had something to do with a, a mountain that was in love with a wave. And uh, th there was a resentment for some reason, and uh, as the, it often happens in love stories. And so the mountain was sent somewhere else. And then the wave found it. And so these are very exciting things. And I have actually, I have a, a, a button that you wear, you know, uh, and it says, stories tell us what is important. And I th think that is a very fine kind of a logo or a, a motto for your work, because uh, that's what you said. No? We, we find out stories about places and it's the stories that make the place special. It's not the food or the patta or the tota or the, uh, the bag or anything else. Yes, all the flora and fauna are very, very precious. And India has the unique... Um, um, quality of having every kind of tourism possible. Absolutely. We can have tourism, we can have educational tourism, we can have a medical tourism, but we can also have religious tourism or we can have um, adventure tourism, we can have mm -hmm. forest and uh, that kind of tourism, then we can have uh, adventure sports tourism, we have snow, we I mean, from Kanyakumari to Kashmir and from Kutch to uh, the Seven Sisters, we have a lot. So uh, there is much to explore and uh, that you are in uh, the Goa area is very exciting. I'm sure that people from other parts of uh, India should link with you and mm -hmm. your ideas because the kind of things that you're doing, they can do where they are. Absolutely. And we have tried doing this. We have tried to connect with other people from across the country and across the world, in fact. So we had this uh, sessions with people from Nigeria, people from uh, Spain, who we, we, so they are basically experienced curators and we kind of try to learn from them, also try to pass what we do here so that we can do it in the best possible way. And also from people across the country. I mean, we have had people from Bombay, from uh, Mysore, uh, from Shimla who are actually interested. And I feel this is the way tourism will uh, progress in future with storytelling, with more of you know, making sure people are actually interested uh, in uh, the stories around it rather than just, uh, you know, showing a thing and uh, expecting them to come. Exactly. I, I mean, uh, the stories actually are ideas. And uh, to me, ideas are far more excited, exciting things. Okay, I have traveled. I have lived in America. I have been to New Zealand. And I've seen uh, many of the states of India. And uh, nothing excites me more than travel. And presently, I'm in Delhi, but I'm from Bhopal. And Madhya Pradesh mm -hmm. is exciting. I have spent time in uh, Tadoba. And uh, so it's not that I want to tell you that I've traveled a great deal. I, I've not traveled so as much as many, many people who have been on the Saturday uh, programs with us. Uh, but I do believe that uh, part of the fact that my mind is as open as it is and is still as simulated as it is, and I am 67, um, <laughs> so it's because of travel. Travel does open your windows. It, it opens your heart. It opens your mind. And uh, let's hope it opens your eyes. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Kaniz. I mean, this is really lovely and it's really uh, a pleasure meeting you. So I'm really, uh, you know, honored to actually interact with you and, you know, listen to your ideas. My, um, I'm also very delighted to meet you because you're a man with the future. <laughs> <laughs> thank you thank you that means a lot we, we would love to hear from others about their experiences any questions to Varun or anything that you would like to add to what Varun said thanks for the wonderful insight into what lovely things you are doing tourism brings people together creates better understanding and harmony and as the lady said removes biases may it flourish in the most Mr. Prashant in the most sustainable way yeah Thank you. Um, All right, Varun. Any any final thoughts? Any final words that you want to add? 
Um, no, so I'm really glad uh, to be a part of this. And uh, the more and more we start talking about this, discussing ideas, the more implementations will happen. Uh, and I really hope people actually take a little bit back from this and try to implement because what we always see that, you know, we have that after, especially after movies and all, and we are really motivated, but you need to take that extra step and implement things. So if you have any stories, anything, connect with me, we are ready to kind of, you know, help them develop uh, because uh, we are looking to change how tourism is done across the country and have more storytellers uh, who want to be a part of this industry. So we work with a lot of colleges as well, trying to make sure students think of this as a career in itself rather than just something they do for the sake of it. And we are lucky to have almost 10 of them who are already a part of the team. Uh, I hope uh, people, uh, you know, understand this, that this is how tourism will kind of, you know, develop and it'll be fun doing this in a sustainable way, as uh, Prashant mentioned, because that is critical for our survival. And uh, yeah, I had a great time today. Uh, just, you know, I always love talking to people. So if you have, want to connect with me, just uh, send me a message or a, a email or text, however you are comfortable, and I'll be happy to uh, chat with you. And uh, Kaniz, it was lovely meeting you. Uh, and Mr. Mugraj, uh, thank you so much for having me today. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much for all. I mean, thank you all of you for your uh, you know participation today, and hope to see uh, you know more phases in our upcoming weeks because I can see that many of uh, uh, today's participants are uh, first timers, and uh, I invite you all uh, to our Saturday sessions every week that happens at four. So we will send out our uh, you know notification emails every week on Tuesdays about what is happening in the upcoming Saturday, and uh, please do uh, take part in those uh, sessions. Thank you and uh, have a good evening, all of you.